All right, let's talk about deformation mechanisms in ceramics, right? In metals, it was pretty straightforward. You had slipping, you had twinning. So can this also happen in ceramics? Sure, dislocation can happen in ceramics, but it's way less likely. Remember before where we plotted the change in energy necessary as you slid atoms past each other, some distance we'll call it just X on this axis. We were down here at the positions, like these are our normal positions right, position one, position two. And for a metal, it looked something like this. Well, for a ceramic, it would look something like that. It has a much higher intermediate state. So think about why. Well, in ceramics, you've got cations and anions, right? So let's say you pick a plane here, right? Right there. So maybe that's the slip system where this uh, you'd expect it to happen. As things start to slide this way, what's gonna happen? This negative is going to be next to this negative, right? They're going to be lined up right there. This positive is going to be next to that one. They're going to be lined up, right? So if you end up in this state, see these where negative is next to negative, positive next to positive, like that. That is extremely not favorable, right? Because ions of the same charge repel one another. So that's this extra bump in the energy. And so basically it says it's not worth it. It's too uh, and computationally and energy expensive. It's too energetically expensive for us to come together. So instead, I'm just going to fracture. I'm going to create new surfaces, which also cost energy, but less than what it was costing to get dislocation to slide past each other. Right? So again, you don't expect much dislocation motion. Covalent bonds are really strong. You don't have good slip systems. And there's these really nasty dislocation structures in the intermediate states. So if you don't get dislocation motion, you don't really get much ductility. You don't get plastic deformation, which is what we observe. Ceramics tend to not really be able to deform. Now, that's crystalline ceramics. What about non-crystalline ceramics, glasses? Well, when you heat them up, first off, there's not any sort of regular structure, so it's not like dislocations can slide through there, but you can get deformation from viscous flow, right? You heat something up, and now just like a liquid can flow, your whole glass can flow in this molten state, essentially, right? Um, this gives rise to this concept of viscosity. Viscosity is an important parameter, especially for glasses. Here's how we calculate it. Viscosity eta is going to be equal to the shear stress that we apply divided by the gradient in the velocity below the sample, right? So dv over dy, right? So if this is your sample and it's over this liquid, right? So your sample is the liquid there. You take a plate across the top and you're going to slide it, right? The liquid right next to the plate is going to travel at the same velocity as the plate. But the liquid at the bottom on the fixed plate is going to travel at zero velocity because this is a fixed plate, so it's not going to move at all. And then you've got this gradient going upward. So again, the shear stress divided by that gradient in velocity is your viscosity, okay? So the units are Pascal seconds. Um, and we've already said this before, but the glassy transition temperature is defined as the temperature when viscosity is equal to 10 to the 12th Pascal seconds, right? There's a useful tool called the Wilhelm Landel Ferry equation. It works for some systems better than others, but it can essentially tell you what the viscosity ought to be as a function of temperature, right? So you need to plug in uh, delta T's in Celsius or Kelvin, otherwise your temperature should be in Kelvin, right? Um, now these, these constants, negative 17.4 and 51.6, those should be determined for each material. These ones here are sort of general values that work for some systems, but they weren't, won't work for everything. If you can, uh, if you know the glassy transition of your material, you plug in your temperature, then you can figure out what your viscosity is at some other temperature. So this is a, a somewhat useful equation for estimating velocity at different or viscosity at different temperatures. Okay. Just some uh, rule of thumb numbers for viscosity. Water is something like 10 to the negative 3 pascal seconds, so not very viscous at all. Whereas thick oil might be like 10 to the minus 1. Whereas glass, right, at room temperature, it could be as high as 10 to the 17th or 18th pascal seconds. So viscosity expands, spans over huge ranges, right? Many, many orders of magnitude, you can have viscosity ranging.